Thank you very much. Well, I shall start with a confession, uh, which is that Hugh gave a very interesting talk about the era of time this morning already, and he seems to have uh, really read all the books by Eddington and comes to the conclusion that there basically is no era of time. Now, I believe I read the same books. However, I came to the opposite conclusion. So, um, if you give me the chance to uh, present you with some arguments which might suggest that there are errors of time rather than, than not. Um, let's start with uh, the Greeks, which is always a very convenient, because when you look at what the Greeks had to say about time, you realize that there's actually a very, very old and well-established link between cosmology and time. Plato called the uh, planets the instruments of time, or another image is that he called time the moving, uh, moving image of eternity. Now Aristotle wasn't quite happy with uh, this sort of characterization of identifying time, identifying time with a particular physical process. I won't go into the arguments, but uh, Aristotle sort of downgraded this a little bit to a criterion. He thought, well, uh, the measurement of time certainly has something to do with uh, celestial motion, but you shouldn't identify celestial motion with, uh, with the nature of time. So I think what we can learn from the Greeks is several things. The first thing is that in order to measure time, we need some sort of regularity. And of course, it would be nice to have a periodic regularity, because that allows you to define, to define finite periods of time. But I think you also need some sort of invariance, uh, which ensures that if you have a translation in time or space, that the measurement of time remain the same. So I think both Plato and Aristotle would agree that uh, you cannot really, I mean, you can look at nature, you can look at physical processes, but what you can't do is read off nature directly, uh, the nature of, sorry, the nature of time directly from uh, nature. What you have to do is use some sort of inference from scientific theories which identify certain processes or the information they provide, and then infer to the arrow of time. Now, talking about inference, as we've heard already in a number of talks this morning, we are really reminded of Eddington and Wheeler, because both of them say that in order to construct physical reality, we have to make inferences. In the case of Eddington, he talks about pointer readings. In the case of Wheeler, it's this famous uh, it from bit, so it's information. And I, I think that's, that's something I would like to retain, this idea of making inferences. And at the end of the talk, I will actually say, yes, that's the right way to go. We can infer the arrow of time from certain inferences that we can make from uh, physical data. Now, before I get on to uh, modern times, uh, I'd like to play a little thought experiment. And that is simply asking the question, did the Greeks, given their cosmology, which of course was <coughs> geocentric, did the Greeks recognize an arrow of time? Well, they certainly uh, used pl planetary motion as a criterion for the passage of time in our cosmic neighborhoods. But if you then ask the question, OK, did they also have a global arrow of time? I think the, 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 the answer is no. And the reason is simply that the Greek universe, remember this is geocentric, is closed, finite, and especially symmetric and eternal. So you wouldn't expect a, a, a global arrow of time from such a, an approach. So I think there's a first lesson, or a second lesson already, that it is legitimate to make a distinction between local arrows of time and global arrows of time. And if you look at um, some of the results of uh, modern theories, 
I think that this distinction is justified. Let me just refer you to CTC's solutions, some solutions to Einstein's field equations, or certain topologies of time, which these pictures come, don't come out very well. But uh, whether the unit is CTC, please. Uh, Close time like curves. Thank you. Sorry. The question about the local and global. Yeah. Sadly, will die eventually is an indicator of a global, um, uh, sorry, a local error of time. The fact that you can leave a, a hot co cup of coffee on the table and eventually grow cold and will never get hot again unless you put it in the microwave is another indicator. What about global? I'll come to that. Most, <laughs> I'll come to that. Um, most of the talk will about, be about the global error. I just think it is important to make that distinction. So uh, the way the universe behaves does depend uh, apparently on this parameter omega. That's the ratio of critical, uh, of actual over critical mass density in the universe. And then depending on whether it's uh, equal to zero, greater or smaller to, uh, than zero, you get different topology. Now, having made that distinction, I want to concentrate for the rest of the talk on the existence of global errors of time. And there have been quite a number of proposals for these cosmic errors. The oldest one is due to Boltzmann and Eddington version A, where they simply identify the cosmic error of time with the increase in entropy. <coughs> understood in the original Boltzmannian sense. Now, each of these proposals has certain uh, disadvantages, and the obvious disadvantage of this identification is that the second law is a statistical law. So you can't really uh, identify uh, what we believe to be a, a unidirectional error of time with a law that allows fluctuations. Another proposal uh, this is uh, for philosophers, this is due to John Ehrman, but physicists have taken that idea up too, which uh, Ehrman calls the time direction heresy. This is just to say, well, our cosmological models have a global time direction. And that's fine. I mean, the standard cosmological models that you look at, these that involve the omega, do have a global time direction. However, the, uh, the downside of this particular proposal is that it doesn't actually tell us whether the actual universe has a global time direction. It just tell, uh, tells us the global time direction of the models, which is not the same thing. And then we come to the gold universe, uh, which has two features. And, uh, although Hugh didn't mention the gold universe, he really hinted at it. Uh, in his insistence on symmetry. So the two features of the gold universe, that's due to Thomas Gold, an American physicist who developed that in the 1960s. The first feature is that the error of time tracks the cosmological uh, expansion of the universe. But the second feature is much more important for proponents of the gold universe, namely that what, you, what is imposed on the gold universe is a symmetry constraint. Now that means a symmetry, a symmetry constraint limited, and I'll come back to that, limited to the boundary conditions. So uh, as you indicated this morning, if you say the universe has a low entropy beginning, symmetry then demands that you postulate a low entropy final condition. And when you read gold, uh, I personally didn't discover that preference for this particular scenario. So if you uh, work on the principle of symmetry, you also have to uh, envisage the following uh, scenario. The universe starts in a high entropy uh, 
of entropy state and ends in a high entropy state. I mean, this is just what the symmetry requires. Now, this sounds good, however, there is a snag, and the snag is that it's not supported by empirical evidence. There is certainly no empirical evidence for a low entropy final condition. On the contrary, the universe is expanding and expanding at an accelerated rate. So uh, this has uh, also certain disadvantages. Now let's come to Eddington version B. And that is something that, I have to say, I discovered this uh, only while reading Eddington. It's almost like a throwaway line in his 30, um, 1935 book, where he suddenly, I won't say he abandons the notion of entropy, but he introduces a second criterion, a second notion to identify the error of time, and that's the expansion of the universe. He doesn't ex uh, discuss this in any detail, but I think it's a promising criterion, a promising idea, because it can be related to some of the modern ideas that you find in the literature, which I want to uh, go on to describe, having to do with phase space volumes, Liouville theorem, and typicality approach. So I'll, I'll uh, try to explain that. But there's a final proposal. Um, the evolving block universe, and that has been around in the philosophical literature for quite a long time. But a physicist or cosmologist who is present in this room has recently published a paper on this idea of the evolving block universe. Uh, and it, the, the way I understand is, is that uh, the universe starts in a particular uh, initial condition, low entropy, and then instead of being just there, as the static block universe envisages, and you talked about that, it's a universe that evolves in four dimensions. So it's a very like Nietzschean picture that as you add the uh, space-time events, the, u the universe expands and grows into an uncertain future. Now you notice the, certainly from the point of view of a proponent of the gold universe, there's a big disadvantage. You have to postulate initial conditions. And that seems to violate the symmetry condition again. So let me uh, briefly uh, describe to you what I, well, I, I believe to have discovered an evolution in Eddington thinking. I didn't get that idea from Hugh's talk this morning. But maybe I don't know, maybe I misread it, or maybe I just concentrated on the passages that I found interesting and he concentrated on other passages. What you find in Eddington thinking very clearly is an insistence on the block universe in the static sense, or Laplacian sense, in the 1920s when he writes a lot of papers on uh, relativity, explains it, and draws some of the philosophical conclusions from it which for many physicists at that time were just to say, well, uh, the, the universe is a block, a static block, and has no uh, dynamic dimension or no error. He drops this idea in the 1930s and turns to the idea that we've got to inject some, some dynamism. And so he begins to think in terms of the universe having an error of how does he do that? Well, he does it in two steps. First of all, as I mentioned briefly before, in the, 1930, the early 1930s, he has a tendency to identify the error of time with the increase in entropy. But very quickly, in 1935, he drops this idea. And he downgrades the idea of identification to a mere criterion. So suddenly, the increase in entropy becomes a mere, in his words, signpost for the error of time. And uh, I think he is quite right to do so, because subsequently, there are a number of objections were made to uh, an identification of the error of time with the second law of thermodynamics. Let me just run, run them past you. 
I mean, first it's pointed out that all, most fundamental laws of physics are time reversal invariant. The second law is not a fundamental law. It is a statistical law. And again, uh, Boltzmann was forced into accepting that it was merely a statistical law after the recurrence and reversibility objections. And of course, if you uh, adopt the idea that the second law is only a statistical law, you have to accept fluctuations. So that's, that's another objection. And the final objection, one that uh, Hugh has also made on a number of occasions, is that probab probabilities are applied to temporal directions. Now, we've already been introduced to one uh, demon, Laplace's demon, let me introduce to another, to another gentleman, namely Lotion's demon. And I will say a little bit more about Lotion's demon later on. But Lotion's demon is basically a reverse Laplace's demon. I'll explain that a little bit further. But Lotion's demon would certainly say that probabilities are blind to temporal direction. So you can't get any direction of time out of mere probability. So I think it would be wrong. I think these objections have some validity. And I think it would be wrong to identify the error of time with an increase in entropy. But going back to what I said earlier about the difference between Plato and Aristotle, we can cite with Aristotle against Plato and say, well, maybe one shouldn't identify it but maybe it can be a useful criterion. However, I have to stress amongst others. That isn't going to be the only criterion. And so using such criteria, uh, entropy and, and the others, some of which I'll mention later on, would allow us to infer errors of time. That's the basic idea. And the reason basically is, so what I want to say is, Second law is good enough for all practical purposes, FABP. A very popular among physicists, this expression. Since thermodynamic systems are weakly T invariant, what this simply means is that in theory, they can, can return to an earlier state of low entropy. In practice, we never experience it. So if you put a an apple on this table, it will rot, and you would have to wait an awful long time for it to grow green again, or for a cup of coffee to grow hot again spontaneously. Uh, this uh, example uh, is from Boltzmann, who calculated that if you have a gas with a volume of 10 to the power of 18 molecules, it will take 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 19 years for it to return to even approximately its original initial state. And that figure is much, much older than the lifetime of the universe. So it will practically never happen. Another reason for being a little bit suspicious <coughs> of um, entropy is that very often, almost in, I mean, you can you read as many textbooks about thermodynamics as you like. Again and again, you read that increase in entropy has something to do with increase in disorder. Even Penrose says these things. Well, I don't think that's a very good idea. First of all, there's some counterexamples that one can use. And secondly, how do you define order? very difficult to define. So I think it would be much better, and this is what some people do, including Penrose, is to associate increase in entropy with what is called the phase space argument A and B, typicality argument. Now, I'll keep them separate here for analytic purposes, but often in the literature you find them mixed up. So let me just uh, develop this a little bit further then. Um, adding 
Clinton's new criterion, which he mentions in 1935, but doesn't really develop, is to say that the expansion of the universe is an irreversible process. You see, the difference between the gold universe and uh, Eddington's idea of an irreversible process is that the gold universe returns to an initial state, while the, the Eddington universe doesn't. Uh, but first of all, let me show you a graph. 
of uh, an illustration of Leobel's theorem. Just to remind you of this, the theorem says that if you take such a volume of, of uh, phase space, it remains volume in volume invariant, so the volume doesn't change. But very interestingly, what does change or what is not guaranteed to remain invariant is the shape. And I think this is not often uh, discussed. And I think that is a, it has an interesting corollary. Namely, if you reverse the evolution of the trajectories, of course, they will preserve the volume, but not the shape. That's not guaranteed by the Leo Hill theorem. So what can happen, uh, as illustrated in this uh, graph here, is that you get from a very ordered system to a very, what it's sometimes called, a fibrillated, very chaotic, massive system. And you see, going back to that idea of uh, a need for a conspiracy of final conditions, which would need the help of Lotion's demon, you get what Eddington said and what people say today, namely that for such a massive fibrillated state to return to its earlier more orderly state. Sorry, I promise not to use that word. <laughs> uh, low entropy state uh, would take, uh, is sim simply extremely unlikely, it's so unlikely that it's manageable. Or unless you employ notion is deep. So I do ask, I have to ask the question, remembering uh, Hugh's talk this morning. Well, do you find this spreading that takes place? Can we avoid these reversibility objections that are associated with Loschmidt's demon? Well, it's in this connection that I think the phase space argument and the typicality argument can be quite useful. So let's first look at the phase space argument. Well, the second law of thermodynamics is no longer now associated with that unmentionable word. It's now associated with a spreading function in phase space. And so you, uh, you, use, you use the thermodynamic probability W to define entropy, which is now a spreading of, this, of the system over larger areas of, say, phase space. And that's captured by this thermodynamic probability. I mean, that's the familiar notion that if you take a particular macro state, like say, you free, you take a snapshot of this room and its temperature, it's very hot here, or I'm very hot, uh, that corresponds to a certain macro state. But if you look at it from the point of the micro states, there are hundreds of thousands of different ways of realizing the macro state. So at least one that uh, typicality cannot be immediately uh, identified with probability notions. So can we avoid Loschmidt's demon um, by relying on these typicality arguments? Well, you, the idea here is just to look at the ratios, not to worry about low entropy initial conditions or a high entropy final condition, just look at the ratios. And if you look at the ratios, I think that uh, in a way uh, the ball is thrown back into the court of those who uh, embrace the gold universe and uh, opt for symmetry considerations. And what they have to face is a particular switchover problem. I'll, I'll briefly try to uh, characterize that. Here I've given two examples. A typical case, an atypical case would be one where this ratio is not is greater than one. A typical, if we get the ratio, the order of the ratio right. And a typical case is one where the ratio is much smaller than now, if you assume, let's go back to the idea of the gold universe with its symmetry in the boundary conditions. 
Imagine that the stick remains uh, no end of the initial conditions, then the symmetry constraint requires the stick remains no end of the final conditions. That's right. But what you now get, and I haven't seen that anywhere, I'm not quite sure, but I haven't seen that anywhere in the literature pointed out, that this actually implies an, an explanatory asymmetry. Because what you get now is that you have normal thermodynamic behavior on one part of the curve, let's say from low entropy initial conditions to the present case, but then you get entry thermodynamic behavior in the final part of the evolution curve, because the universe is supposed to go back to low entropy final conditions. You need to explain that switch over there. And the Rose universe does not provide a dynamical explanation of this switch over. You can take it on the other way around. If you start with high entropy initial conditions, then symmetry demands that you uh, stipulate high entropy final conditions. You get the same asymmetry in explanation because, again, you will have part of the evolution curve that follows the second law, and part of the evolution curve that doesn't follow the second law. And as I say, I haven't seen any explanation from proponents of the Rose universe of this, of this switch order. Okay, well, I think I can conclude. And my conclusion is the following. Of course, all I've done is you, is giving you possibilities. Sounds plausible. What, of course, is really required is a dynamical explanation. And people have come up with quite a number of dynamical explanations for the behavior of the second law. We're going to just pick out two of these. Gelman, Mann, and Hartzell have used the uh, notion of environmental decoherence, which was developed in the 1970s. And transformed it into a cosmological decoherence, where it no longer means that the environment measures a particular quantum system, which then leaks its phase relations into the environment. No. What it means is that classical space-time uh, uh, emerges from an underlying quantum state of the universe through this mechanism called Decoherence. So decoherence, I would regard both in the environmental and cosmological sense as an, another valuable criterion for the arrow of time without looking up at entropy. And then uh, Hugh mentioned uh, Sean Carroll's um, scenario. This is actually, Sean Carroll actually calls this model baby saw all these, you know, these universes popping up all over the place. That's only one of the models. Another one is oscillating universes. Um, Penrose is one of the proponents of that. And the great thing about these speculations, and there's not more than that, they're speculations, is that if they manage, they get rid of the Big Bang singularity. And that's the attraction of the Zetari. Because the singularity at the moment in cosmological theory is cooking by hand. And what they want to do is explain where, where the, the low entropy uh, initial condition comes from. And then if you are committed to symmetry, you can have it back. Because even, well, Hugh explained it this morning how you can get symmetry back. But in oscillating universes, you also get the symmetry. Because the final condition uh, of the uh, previous universe becomes the init initial condition of our universe, of birth of our universe, which then eventually collapses into black holes or a terrible mess with very high entropy. But out of this mess, and this is how Penrose explained it, another universe emerges, this, which starts with low entropy. Again. So you get the symmetry not 
within a particular universe, but across the universe. But I, at the moment, these are just stories. So, uh, let me finally come to, uh, come to my conclusion. Are there errors of time? Well, as I said at the beginning, I think uh, while I wouldn't embrace the role of influence or the work that Wheeler and Eddington put the role of influence to, I would certainly say it, it works for the arrow of time. What we have from looking at the universe is a number of empirical data, and they allow us to infer, they provide the criteria from which we can infer that there are arrows of time. So I'm not a believer in the clock universe, I'm not a believer in 